Welcome to the Prince Street Church Sermon Podcast, where God's Word speaks to everyday life. Last week, we began a series of messages that I've called Worship Rising. Within this series, we are exploring the role that worship plays in our journey of becoming healthy, growing, reproducing disciples of Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about the fact that worship is not what many people think about the first moment they hear that word. Worship is not some religious activity that happens on Sunday morning. We hope that worship happens when we gather together on Sunday mornings, but it doesn't necessarily mean worship will happen just because we came together. It's entirely possible to walk through these doors Sing some songs, listen to a prayer, give an offering, listen to the sermon, even take notes, and yet never have worshipped. Worship isn't this one hour on, something, on Sunday morning. No, instead, worship is our response to the revelation of God. God reveals himself to us, and we respond to him hopefully within this hour on Sunday morning, but I can't be contained by this one hour on Sunday morning. This is a lifelong kind of thing. God responds, or God reveals himself, and we respond. If you missed last Sunday's message, I want to urge you to go to our website at princestreetchurch.com because this statement, this definition that we're building off of, this is our foundation for everything we're going to be talking about over these next couple of weeks. If you go to princestreetchurch.com, right there on the front page, you'll find a link to sermons. Just click right there. You can either watch online or you can download an audio podcast to take it with you. So, for example, if you happen to be driving to Indiana today like I am, actually I'm only getting to Ohio today, but uh, you could listen on your drive or you could listen on your way to work. You can, you can take it with you and listen whenever it works for you. Now, if worship, if we're going to define worship as our response to the revelation of God, and if we're going to expand this definition of worship to be outside of the walls of this building, then the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we prepare ourselves for worship? How do we make sure that when God reveals himself to us, that we are ready to respond. I'm always amazed when I hear the statement, well, I didn't get anything out of worship at all this morning. And I got to tell you, my first response is to say, well, that's okay, because this wasn't about you. This was about God. And the question you should be asking is not, what did I get out of it? The question you should be asking is, what did I put into it? Now, I've learned over time to hit the self-edit button before those words actually come out of my mouth. But brothers and sisters, if worship is going to be our response to the revelation of God, we've got to get our eyes off of worshiping ourselves. We've got to put away this idea that worship is about what I want and when I want it, and the kind of singing I want, and the kind of scripture that I want, and the kind of whatever it is that I want. Because it isn't about us. For that matter, if worship is about us, guess who's God? It's not what worship is. If we're going to honor God with everything we are, if we're going to live lives of worship, we've got to get our eyes off of ourselves. We've got to prepare ourselves so that when God reveals something to us, that we are ready to respond to the revelation of God. See, worship requires preparation. We can't assume that just because we got up in the morning, and we can't assume that just because we walked through the doors of a church, that we're prepared for worship. 
We need to prepare ourselves so that when God reveals himself, we're ready to respond. We are ready to worship. Take, take athletes, for example. Athletes don't just show up on game day and expect to perform. That's what fans do. Athletes spend hours and hours and hours and hours preparing their bodies, preparing their minds, preparing their hearts, getting themselves physically and emotionally and mentally prepared before they ever think about going to the stadium. And then on game day, like right now, there are gridiron gladiators getting ready. Kickoff isn't for hours. But they're already getting themselves ready. They're making sure that they've got the right food in their bodies. They're getting sure that they're taking one last check of the game plan so they know how they're going to attack. They're getting themselves emotionally prepared. they got those great big headsets on. Pumping that music. Getting themselves ready to go. So that when kickoff happens, they are physically and mentally and emotionally prepared to respond to the game with their maximum performance. Brothers and sisters, worship is our response to the revelation of God. And if we want to make sure that we are prepared for worship, if we want to make sure that when God reveals himself, we don't miss it, that when God reveals himself, instead we recognize the revelation of God happening in our midst, and we respond to that in worship, then we've got to prepare ourselves for every day. Every moment of every day. Now, there's a character in the Old Testament. His name is Ezra. And Ezra understood the significance of preparing himself for worship. So grab your Bible and join me at Ezra chapter 7. Now, Ezra is a little bit of a difficult book to find. Ezra is in the first half of the Old Testament. So as you're flipping through... so. You know, the best way to get there, if you're not sure, right in the beginning of your revival, you have a table of contents, and it'll tell you exactly what page Ezra you'll find Ezra on, all right? Uh, now, if you're one of those flip-through kind of persons, if you get to Psalms, you got too far. Go backwards, all right? So Ezra, that's where we're heading. Now, as you get to Ezra, let me give you a little bit of a background. Ezra was a priest, which means that his job was to lead God's people in worship. Now that sounds simple enough, but there's a big problem for Ezra. Ezra lived during the period of the exile. To make a long story short, God's people for an extended period of time were unfaithful in worship. They did not honor God with everything they had. Consequently, God, as a way of getting their attention, uses the pagan empire of Babylon to come in and take Judah captive. The Babylonians come in, they destroy Jerusalem, knock every, not one stone stayed on top of another. And they carried off the best and the brightest to Babylon, destroying Jerusalem. Israelite social and religious systems. Seventy years go by. Long enough that all the adults who used to know what worship looked like when everybody came to the temple together, they're all dead. And finally, God releases the Israelites from exile in Babylon. They're allowed to return to Jerusalem. And their first task when they get back is a construction project. They, they rebuild a temple. And that's a good thing. But a building is nothing but stick and mortar. What's important is how you use the building. And there's nobody around who knew what collective worship was supposed to look like. So Ezra is sent from Babylon 
to Jerusalem. And as he's coming to Jerusalem, he knows his job is to teach a group of people how to worship who've never experienced worship before. Now, if that's your job, how do you know how to start? Where, where do you even begin to teach a people how to worship who've never experienced worship before? Well, Ezra starts by preparing himself. Ezra, chapter 7, verses 8 to 10, says this. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Did you see? Did you see what Ezra did? Did you see how Ezra prepared himself to lead others in worship? Ezra devoted himself to the study and the observance of the law of the Lord. Ezra devoted himself to recognizing the revelation of God through the scriptures and to responding to that revelation with his whole life. Notice, Ezra doesn't just read a verse or two when he has a chance on the way to work if he's not too late. Ezra doesn't just listen to a sermon once a week when he has the opportunity and if there isn't fishing to do. No, Ezra devotes himself to the study of God's word. And it isn't just a mental exercise. You can know everything there is in this book. You can know God better than anybody else in the world intellectually and have it make absolutely no sense in your soul. And have it make absolutely no difference in your life. The question isn't, how much did I learn about God? The question isn't, how much do I know of God's word? The question is, how much of God's word is active in my life? And that is what Ezra devoted himself to. He devoted himself to knowing the word and doing the word. His first step in getting ready to lead his people in worship, is to be a worshiper himself. To prepare himself so that as God reveals himself, he's able to respond. He's able to worship. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a key principle here. When it comes to being prepared to worship God, the one thing we've got to do above everything else is to take God and lift Him up. We've got to place God in His rightful place. For God is not our peer. He is not our buddy. He is not the big man upstairs. God is majestic in splendor. He is perfect in holiness. He is unlimited by time. He's unlimited by place. He's unlimited in his power. He's unlimited in his knowledge. He is the creator and the sustainer of everything that is. And did you know we don't even see everything that is? There is an invisible realm we can't even perceive. And God not only created that, he sustains that too. How does that work? I have no idea. I'm nowhere near smart enough to figure that out. None of us are. That's how great God is. You want to be prepared to worship God. You want to be prepared so that when God reveals himself, you are ready to explode in worship. Take God and lift him up to his rightful place far above any problem far above any concern you'll ever have in your life because when god is lifted to his rightful place our problems become nothing our biggest problem is no big deal to god you solve that problem just that fast don't even have to think about how to do it 
You want to live a life of worship? Take God and lift him up. Every moment of every day, exalt Christ. Place God in his rightful place in the heavens and take your rightful place as the sheep of his pasture. The person God created and redeemed and adopted to be his very own child. I mean, if we'll, if, we'll just, if we'll just focus ourselves on lesson one from Theology 101, you know what it is, right? God is God, I am not. <laughs> you know, you could probably spend your whole life just, just unraveling that one. Just, just, God is God, I'm not. I'm going to let him have the throne, I'm going to take my place at his feet. I'm going to let him call the shots, and I'm going to do whatever he says. And as he reveals himself to me, I'm going to respond whatever he asks me to do. Ah, if we'll do that, then, then the cares and the concerns of this world, well, they just sort of melt away. In the light of God's glory, in the light of God's grace. So let me ask you a question. This is sort of one of those, this is one of those meddling questions. What place does God have in your life right now? Now, don't, don't answer too quickly, because I know the religious answer. Well, I have God, God has first place, God is first, my family is second, the church is third. I understand that. I, I, that's what we're always, or that's the quick answer. But, but be honest with yourself. Who comes first? Where is God in relationship to your health care? Is he first? Where is God in relationship to your entertainment? Is he first? Where is God in relationship to your children and your grandchildren? Is he first? Where is God in relationship to you? Is he first? If you want to be prepared for worship, lift God up. Let him be who he is and take your rightful place at his feet and you'll find yourself prepared for worship. Whether it's walking through the door here on a Sunday morning or walking into the grocery store on, I think it's Tuesday, right? <laughs> Lifting God up to his rightful place doesn't just happen because you get out of bed in the morning. It takes intentional effort. So I want to get really practical. I want to talk about some very specific ways that the scriptures call us to lift God up, to prepare ourselves so that when God reveals himself, we are ready to respond. We're ready for worship. Let's start with our bodies. If we want to be ready to respond to the revelation of God, we have to prepare our bodies for worship. Let me read you a passage of scripture here. You probably know this one quite well. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of what? Worship. Yeah. You want to be prepared for worship. Prepare your body. And brothers and sisters, our bodies don't belong to us. We have been bought with a price. The blood of Christ shed on Calvary. So when God says, I want you to walk across that room and pray with a stranger, you better get your feet moving. Because your feet don't belong to you. And it doesn't matter if you want to or not. And if God says, I want you to go over there and I want you to whisper, I want you to give a word of encouragement. 
you better get your lips moving because your lips don't belong to you. They've been bought with a price. And if God says, I want you to listen to a teenager who's really having a problem, he doesn't need advice, doesn't need one, now here's what you ought to do, doesn't need six spiritual laws or five spiritual laws or three spiritual laws or however many scriptures you want to throw at them. All they need is somebody who'll listen. Then you better get your ears working and shut your mouth because your ear and your mouth don't belong to us. They belong to God. And if we want to be ready for worship, we've got to have our bodies ready. I, one of the things I loved to do when David was younger, I loved to teach coaching basketball. I, I loved to coach basketball with the kids. Now that my boys are older, I'm, I'm still involved in their stuff. Maybe when they're out of the house, I'll get back to coaching basketball. And, and one of the things that we always coach them is be in a ready position. You know, get your knees bent, get one foot in front of the other, and, and be ready. Look at their belt buckle, well, look at the waistband, because where their waist goes, that's where they're going to do, and get ready so that no matter which way they go, you're ready to respond, and you shuffle and you glide, and you make your body ready to respond. Brothers and sisters, how prepared is your body for what God is doing in your life right now? How ready is your body to respond to the revelation of God. And let's get really, really practical. How about this morning? I mean, this is the day the Lord has given us. So let's talk about today. Tomorrow you can fix what you didn't do right today. All right. How prepared were you for worship when you walked through the door this morning? Did you get to bed at a decent hour last night and get up early enough to have a nutritious breakfast? Or were you just so glad there's going to be padded pews so that you can take a better nap? Or, or maybe you're somewhere in between all of that. But brothers and sisters, worship is not a religious activity. If that's all it is for you, you are wasting your time. There's no value to it whatsoever, to just going through the motions. If we're going to lift God up to his rightful place, high and exalted, we're going to have to give God more than our physical leftovers. He deserves our best. That means we've got to prepare our bodies for worship. I haven't meddled near enough. Let me give you another. If we want to be ready to respond to the revelation of God, we have to prepare our minds for worship. Let me give you another passage of scripture here. Jot this down in your note sheet so you can reflect on it. Psalm 124. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been our side when men attacked us, when their, when their anger flared, uh, flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We've escaped like a bird out of the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Yeah. You see, we have to decide that God is worthy of our worship and our praise. If we're going to be prepared to respond, we've got to have some mental activity going on. Because if we allow ourselves to think we deserve something or we've earned something, we're never going to worship. Instead, we've got to remember everything that I have, the fact that I opened my eyes this morning and took a breath, that comes from God. And we've been, when we begin putting everything that we have and everything we do within this context of being a gift from God, then as we start reflecting on all of the things that God has given and all of the ways that God has provided and all of the ways that God has protected, when it seemed like all hope was lost, God 
opened a window and we escaped. And, and when we just start even thinking for just a moment of the glorious, the glorious activity of God in our lives, then we won't be able to help but worship. So let's boil it back to today. When you walk through the door this morning, how prepared was your mind for worship? Did you spend some time this morning reflecting on the glories of God? Or did you just walk through the door with your heart so burdened down with problems that you're numb? Or maybe you're somewhere in between. But brothers and sisters, if we're going to take God and lift him to his rightful place, then we are going to have to give him more than our mental leftovers. He deserves our best. If we're going to be able to worship God, if we're going to be prepared, then we've got to respond by, pre by preparing our minds for worship. One more. If we want to be ready to respond to the revelation of God, we've got to prepare our hearts for worship. Let me take you to another psalm, Psalm 9. Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I'll be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Do you sense the enthusiasm? Do you sense the emotion in that? Brothers and sisters, God has given us this great gift of emotion. And don't give me this, well, you just have to understand, Pastor Jim, in this valley we're just not very emotional. Garbage, because I see you driving, shaking your fist on 81. And I see you express and I hear you expressing your displeasure to referees at basketball games. Don't give me this. We're not emotional people. Yes, we are. We've just decided that when we when we worship, we do this. <laughs> Why? Well, because that's what mama told me. Maybe mama's wrong. I'll step out of the way before you start throwing stuff. Who are you going to go with, Mama or the Bible? I've told you a thousand times, don't believe something just because I said it. Don't believe it just because Mama said it either. Read the scriptures. Boy, I'd love to take you to Costa Rica and have you meet that little boy that asked me, doesn't the Bible say we should dance before the Lord? Well, yes, it does, huh? Then why don't you? And I'm not saying that every moment of, of our collective times together, we have to all look like that kid, the little kid from Sierra Leone. Did you see him? Yeah, baby. Woo! I don't care what I look like because it's not a matter of what you think of me. It's about what God thinks of me when it comes to worship. Maybe at least we can look like the Liberians. <laughs> you know, our head won't move, but we'll shuffle side to side with our feet. You know, God has given us this great gift of emotion. Let's use it to glorify him. And that's not just going to happen by accident. you got to prepare yourself. you got to prepare your heart for that. So again, let me get re really right down to brass tacks. How are you this morning when you walk through the door when it comes to preparing your heart for worship? Did you spend some time this morning centering your affections on God? Or are you just going through the emotions? So maybe you're somewhere in between. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to worship God, if we're going to prepare, be prepared for worshiping, we've got to give God more than our emotional leftovers. He deserves our best. 
And that means we're going to have to prepare our hearts for worship. As we close this morning, I want to give you time to to interact with God. On the back side of your note sheet, on the bottom side, some of you already put it away. You ought to learn by now that eventually I come back to it. Bottom side, you've got a little box there. There's two two sentence fragments. What God said to me, what I'm going to do about that. As the worship team comes to lead us in this final song, I want to give you some time to just Interact with God on that. Finish those sentences. What is it that God's been whispering in your ear? And what is it that you're going to do about that? How will you respond to the revelation of God, not just today, but tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that? How are you going to make worship stop being just some religious activity that you do because Sunday morning came? And allow it to be your lifelong response to the revelation of God. Take some time and interact with God right now.